UFC Fight Night Denver actually, to my surprise, over-delivered. Until we got to the main event and Rose Nami Hunis. 50-45 Tracy Cortez. But it was a stinky main event, which just goes to show that a main event is incredibly important. That sapped the energy right out of the building in Colorado. Either way, the fight night was incredible. And I'm going to recap every single fight on this card. Uh, I got the main event right. I don't know how anyone could have picked Tracy Cortez. I feel like a lot of us just knew that she was going to get outclassed. Former champion Rose Namajunas. Tracy Cortez, who's not that good. She's just hyped up because of her looks. Um, either way, let's get into it. Let's break all of these fights down. I went 6-3 and three in total. I did not predict the first fight on the card, Evan Elder versus Darius Flowers, because that fight wasn't announced until a couple of days after my prediction video. Darius Flowers, I don't know what it is about this guy. He's always doing well. He's very entertaining. He's high output. If you take this dude down and he ends up on his back in the second round, he's tapping to a head and arm choke. The exact same thing happened when he fought Jake Matthews. I saw him on the ground. He wasn't, he was actually in dominant position. In the second round, I was telling my chat, he might gas out and, you know, he might get tapped out by an arm triangle or submission, just like Jake Matthews hit. Wait on it. And it happened a couple seconds later. So Evan Elder gets it done. Good win for Evan Elder. Darius Flowers, uh, you can always count on this guy to get submitted via an uh, arm triangle choke in the second round. Kamar Usman and Anthony Smith are actually on screen. Good to know that Anthony Smith's doing well. I'm just looking at my TV. It's still on. Um, there's Dean Thomas. And we are on to the next fight. Uh, Josh Friend versus Andre Petrosky. Uh, Andre Petrosky showcased his grappling and dominated this fight. I was saying, you know what? I kind of want Josh Frem to win, even though I picked Andre Petrosky. I was saying, I kind of don't mind Josh Frem winning because that would make Roman Kopulov's win age well. Uh, all jokes aside, Andre Petrosky actually dominated this fight. Not as boring as some of the people were making it out to seem in my chat. It was actually all right. He was actively grappling. He was in dominant position most of the fight, but there were some good scrambles. Josh Fremd every now and then would throw up like a a triangle, try to hit a triangle on bottom, and Andre Petrosky would get out of it. Really showing that that Philly grappling that he's learning with uh, Sean Brady and Joe Pfeiffer. Good performance from Andre Petrosky. Roman Kopulov, his wins are just not aging that well. Not saying, listen, I'm kind of just joking around now, but I guess people always talk about how I hype up Roman Kopulov. <laughs> One of his wins is over Josh Fremd. And Josh Fremd is getting dog walked by Andre Petrosky. So that's pretty funny. Petrosky's all right. Living up to his name tonight as a good wrestler. It was proven. You never know if a guy like Josh Fremd is just going to fucking blow Andre Petrosky out of the water and destroy him. And just totally shatter everyone's perspective on the sport. But Petrosky held down the fort. Okay. Luana Santos submitted Maria Agapova. That was a great win as well. Not a whole lot to break down, but let's talk about this because this is where things get interesting. Uh, Damon Blackshear and Montel Jackson had a war, an absolute war that lasted 15 seconds until Damon Blackshear must have read the Giannis Scamori handbook, okay? Because this guy waded into range, like just straight up floated into range with his hands down. I can't even say he was throwing anything. He floated into range with his hands down. And it looked like he was about to lift his knee to maybe throw a kick. One centimeter in front of Montel Jackson. And Montel Jackson just fucking caught him with a nasty right hand. It was basically the exact same finish at the exact same time of the fight. That we saw a couple weeks ago on International Fight Week from Peyton Talbot. This time it's from Montel Jackson, who I picked to win the fight because of his power advantage. He's got a ton of knockdowns in the Bantamweight division. One of the few very knockdown heavy sort of fighter in the Bantamweight division that you can always count on to get knockdowns. Damon Blackshear, good grappler. We saw nothing of him tonight. Just him waltzing into range. I don't know what he was doing. Like it didn't even look like he was about to throw a kick. He just went into range. It looked like Montel Jackson maybe trapped one of his lead hands and maybe 
kind of lowered them a little bit before he landed his right. But I think it's time that Montel Jackson, who's been winning, who's on a crazy win streak, I think it's time that this guy gets a ranked opponent. I mean, he's been having an entertaining style. He's been dropping people all over the octagon for ages. Why not get this guy up the rankings? Like, it's time. This was his breakout performance. I hope the UFC gives him someone ranked. I would say maybe him versus Mario Batista. Some people were suggesting maybe a Peyton Talbot or a Raul Rosas Jr. I don't want to cancel out any of the other prospects. Let's put Montel Jackson, who is experienced, in the top 15 against someone like Mario Batista. Or, you know, I'm always bringing up the Bashrat brothers. I know the real hardcore fans love the Bashrat brothers. Maybe throw them to the freaking Bashrat brothers and we'll, we'll see what's what, okay? We'll find out what reality is like. Get the hardcore fans out of Peaches and Creamville. Uh, either way, let's get on to the next one. Jasmine Jasuda Vicious versus Fatima Klein. I didn't even watch the fight, but I picked Jasmine Jasuda Vicious. I think we may have been playing UFC 4. Either way, that was a correct pick for me. Joshua Van versus Charles Johnson. Okay, a lot of people are going to want to hear my take because I had a lot of fun with my prediction for this fight. I was saying, you know, Charles Johnson's one of those old guys that everyone talks about as like a longtime UFC vet. They have they speak of this guy, they lionize him so much, but I just don't see it. Like I don't he doesn't have the experience they hype him up for having. He's got like eight fights in the UFC. They act like he's a 30-year vet, a World War II vet, okay? Um, and I just think Joshua Van's going to piece him up. You know, Charles Johnson's one of those guys that's good enough to hold the gates up against the NPCs, but Joshua Van and his, you know, real personhood is going to go in there and freaking out-volume Charles Johnson. Okay, so I was silly. But Charles Johnson actually had an amazing performance. This was the best performance of Charles Johnson's career, and I was wrong. But not only was I wrong, not only did Charles Johnson step his game up, I think he really got motivated for this fight because, you know, these guys pay attention to their division. They know who's getting hyped. He had to know Joshua Van was getting hyped from the fans. He had to know this guy's hyped up. I want to sh- I want to put on a statement. Okay, he got up for this one because he outvolumed Joshua Van, who is the volume guy. Now, one thing I want to say is I know I got my pick wrong. That takedown defense of Joshua Van, I've been hyping it up. That's one of the reasons why I compare him to Holloway, because it's like, all right, well, you know, Holloway's not just about striking. He's also got the ability to keep the fight standing. Joshua Van's got brick wall level takedown defense. And every single time he's been, any, every time someone's attempted a takedown, he's shucked it off easily. So the takedown defense talking point is still there. And he did well. But the difference in this fight was the volume and the range. Charles Johnson obviously was the taller, bigger, rangier guy. Joshua Van is one of the smallest flyweights on the roster. He doesn't have a long reach. And Charles Johnson came out the gates just going off, throwing the kitchen sink, sitting behind his range. Sweet pea specials, jabs, leg kicks. He was doubling up, tripling up on kicks, leg kick, body kick, teep, jab, staying active. The end of the round, Joshua Van started to find his rhythm, find his range. And it got competitive. Second round, Joshua Van landed like a four or five punch combination flurry in the opening minute. And things were getting interesting. A lot of people were saying Joshua Van won that round. He didn't. I know Joshua Van was doing well in the second round, but he didn't win that round. All right. After that big flurry for the majority of the round for every one of Joshua Van's strikes, Charles Johnson would legitimately land like five. So Johnson's output was insane because Van was throwing good output. But again, the difference was it's so difficult to get in on the inside of a guy like Charles Johnson in his range because he's got such a good reach advantage, good cardio. He's throwing the right strikes to keep you at bay, to keep you guessing. And Charles Johnson, with a little bit of momentum carrying over from the end of the second round, floods the gates, charges at Joshua Van, ambushes him, shows him... A a, a different sort of energy than they were striking at. Different rhythm. Goes right in his face. Lands a nasty clubbing right hand on the temple of Joshua Van. Similar to the strike that Tom Aspinall landed on the head of Sergei Pavlovich. And he kind of wobbled him around. He he ran at him. Hit him with a nasty uppercut. Big follow-up shot. Joshua Van goes down. The ref steps in after the follow-up shot that I just mentioned. 
perfect stoppage. And right off the bat, it sucks that Joshua Van got finished. He's getting a lot of hype. But it's good that it was three punches that did damage. It was only three really concussive blows. The uppercut, the right hand that rocked him initially, and the follow-up shot. But the referee jumped in at the perfect time. So you never want to see one of these young prospects take too much damage, especially when they're strikers. Um, he's only 22. He can come back from this, and it's not a fraud check. A fraud check would be if Joshua Van got dominated pillar to post and he was like the volume guy and he just got totally toasted and he wasn't competitive. He was competitive. He lost the fight. He was losing the fight, got knocked out. But he was competitive, 22 years old. I mean, I still think he, the sky is the limit for this guy. Maybe not the sky is the limit, but I still think he could be very good. For Charles Johnson, that was a ranked worthy performance. I think Charles Johnson from that should get a ranked opponent. Um, the best he's ever looked. He, he stepped his game up big time for this fight. I knew he was good. I knew he was all right. I, I said that he was the guy that gets prospects out of there, but Joshua Van is one of the best prospects. Uh, now let's talk about Van's future because I am a little bit worried. He is on the shorter side for flyweight. He's got a short reach for flyweight and he's not really big. You know what I mean? He's not like Pantoja. Pantoja's short. He's stocky, but he's like big. He's got a lot of muscle. He's got a lot of mass. Van seems to be the smallest one in every single one of his fights. He's young. He's got amazing technique. He's got good composure. He's got pretty decent toughness. He's got great cardio. He's got great wrestling defense. I think he should take a little bit of time off and bulk up. Not to bantamweight, obviously, but I think he should bulk up, put on a couple more extra pounds of muscle, uh, put on some extra mass. Add some pop to those punches because, again, he is going to face people like Charles Johnson that have reach advantages over him in the future, that have range advantages over him in the future. And I think it would help if he just gets a little bit more sting on the punches that he has because even though he has decent power, it's not great. And uh, he's got the combinations to knock people out. You know what I mean? Uh, put on a little bit more mass, and I think that this guy could take a year off and be just fine. He'll be, what, 23, 24 if it takes a year and a half off. He's still young, so Joshua Van, in my opinion, is still going to be a top five guy in the future. Charles Johnson, get him a ranked opponent. Amazing performance, uh, and he proved me wrong. I thought it was going to be the best fight of the night. It was the best fight of the night until we got to Dober and Gene Silva. We'll talk about that later. Sorry, guys, I was just uh, waiting for Cody Brundage to get on the stage to give his Oscar-winning speech. And I clapped for him after he gave his Oscar-winning speech. So, really amazing performance from Cody Brundage. Acting on point. Um, the second time it's happened, there was some doubt. There was some doubt. I was starting to think, is this guy acting? You know, but Cody Brundage um, sealed the deal tonight. Uh, he did the same thing against Jacob Malkoon. Fair enough, the power shots from Abdul Razak al Hassan were a little bit stronger than the ones that Jacob Malkoon was landing. But it was the same performance. It's one of those things where it's like, all right, I'm not always into the sequel. The sequels aren't always, aren't always as good as the first one, but this one was even better. This was one of those rare sequels, part twos, that was actually better than the first movie. Um, and honestly, I mean, it's all, I'm getting choked up just thinking about this fight. Cody Brundage runs at Abdul Razak al Hassan. Abdul Razak al Hassan is elbowing Cody Brundage into oblivion. Honestly, I think that they should have just given him the fucking finish, but uh, I would have complained about that. Honestly, I thought the ref stepped in to, to call it a finish, and Cody Brundage did too. Then the referee does timeout, and I'm like, thank goodness it's not a finish because I kind of wanted to see if Brundage would have battled back. Thank goodness it's timeout and Brundage is going to battle back. And then... As soon as the referee says, back of the head, you can literally see Cody Brundage slump into the into his knees a little bit and assume the posture of Aljamain Sterling when Aljamain Sterling found out that the title was going to be given to him and the fight was going to end if he didn't want to continue. Cody Brundage did the old squinty eyes, what happened, where am I, type of thing. After he was totally fine. It looked like he was about to start complaining about the early stoppage. And then he realized 
oh wait, it's it's they're stopping it because it was a back of the head shot. Let me amp this up and pretend that I'm hurt. And he played it off, and he got it done. Uh, I don't think they gave him the win, but either way, he got the win money. Or the, the show money. And that's the way of Cody Brundage at this point, honestly. Abdul Razak al Hassan was heated. He was pissed. Does anyone really buy that Brundage was that hurt? I'm telling you, he was doing the most obvious squinty eyes on purpose. The, the lights are so bright. I don't know. I didn't buy it. But amazing performance. Let's get on to the next one. Julian Arosa versus Christian Rodriguez. Wow. Julian Arosa is the real Christian Rodriguez. Meaning he takes a beating early and then somehow wins. Christian Rodriguez is the king of getting his ass kicked early and, and winning. Julian Arosa, the second guillotine choke in a row after his opponent is whooping his ass. He's slow. He's got an awkward, wiry, rangy style. He's not got even the best chin. Christian Rodriguez is freaking thudding him up, punching him up. Piecing him up. And Christian Rodriguez, former bantamweight. I know I talk about bantamweight skill. We'll get to the skill gap of uh, Gene Silva over Dober in a minute. But Julian Arosa, former 155er, submits bantamweight skill Christian Rodriguez. Now, to be fair, Christian Rodriguez is hyped up a little bit. He did lose to Dolgarian. He got his ass kicked for like 10 minutes of that fight and only won the third. He shouldn't have won that fight. He got his ass kicked in the first round against Raul Rosas Jr. Raul Rosas kind of made a mistake in expending the gas tank too much early. And then he had a four-pound weight advantage over Cameron Simon, and it was a very close fight. So to be fair, he was never that great. But either way, I thought he would be good enough to beat Julian Arosa if he can grapple a little bit with a guy like Raul. Or if he can stand with Simon. Or if he can at least hang in there and survive old Dolgarian. But Julian Arosa subs him. And it wasn't even like he just dove into a submission. No, Julian Arosa set it up really well. Had a really good, solid, uh, mounted guillotine submission. Really good work. He, that's the Arosa choke, right? That's the thing. You got to be aware of this guy guillotining you. He's one of the guys that he can actually fuck you up consistently with guillotines. So really solid work for Julian Arosa. I doubted him. I picked against him. And Christian Rodriguez gets fraud checked. Even though he wasn't really like... You know, he wasn't like a hyped up prospect or whatever, but you get my point. A lot of us expected him to win. Uh, the tough out, Angelusa versus Gabriel Bonfim. Angelusa, tough out, won the first round. I gave Bonfim the second and the third. The knees to the body from Bonfim were nasty, all right? Bonfim's clinch work, clinch striking was filthy in this fight. You saw it. There were moments where he would just get Angelusa into the tie clinch and tee off on him with like four knees in a row. I don't know how Angelusa's not hunching over and huffing and puffing after taking those, but he's a tough out. We call him the tough out for the reason. He's like the welterweight Pedro Munoz. Whatever you do to this guy, you can't put him away. Not even JDM could put this guy away. And JDM had like a three-round slugfest grit battle with this dude. So I don't know what Angelusa is made of, but in the third round, Gabriel Bonfim stepping in, kneeing this dude to the solar plexus, just nasty clinch work. Uh, pieced him up in the third. It was close. I had it 1-1 going into the third. Bonfim winning the second. Lusa winning the first. Lusa went out there in the first round like a bat out of hell, taking down Bonfim, jabbing him up. Uh, had a very active game plan early, but sort of faded as the fight went on with a volume and kind of resorted to the CPU of UFC 4 would, would buffed up uh, durability. And Bonfim just pieced him up in the third, you know, pieced him up with the jab. Nice uppercuts from Bonfim too. Good boxing. He is very hittable, but, you know, to be fair, he was throwing the kitchen sink at Angelusa. He was hitting Angelusa with punishing blows that would finish a lot of fighters. And so he was putting himself in, in harm's way to get the finish. And Lusa's just right there taking everything and able to dish back his own strike. So maybe Bonfim gets a lot of people out of there with the strikes he can land on Angelusa. Uh, he looked great on the feet, though. A couple of those reactionary submission attempts from Bonfim didn't go over so well. He ended up on his back both times pulling a guillotine. I don't think he should pull guillotine anymore moving past this point because he's just going to end up on his back against higher-level grapplers. But either way, he's had it work in the past. I understand him going for it. He looked good. Lusa, the tough out as usual. Let's get on to the next one. This is the fight of the night. Dober versus Gene Silva. Featherweight skill, Gene Silva gets it done. Okay? I talked about Gene Silva's defense 
and his flow state. How not only does he have good head move, but he could just see things coming and he could just get right out of the way. Gene Silva has like a calmness to his striking to where he's just so composed. Like it's almost as if like everything slows down when someone throws a head kick in his direction. He effortlessly gets out of the way. It's really interesting how this guy is able to operate by being like a marauder offensively, but defensively he seems like he's like a more finesse style of striker. Gene Silva gets it done. I picked him to win. Two weeks notice, in part due to the defense, in part due to the power, and a TKO in the third round. It's a little bit weird considering, like, you, you know, I don't... It's weird considering Dr. Stoppage's as TKOs. But either way, that was a nasty cut on the eye of Drew Dober. He rocked Dober badly in the second round. At the end of the second round, which Dober was arguably winning... And that left there no doubt. That left uh, no doubt to the judges that Gene Silva had stole that round. But that was an insane moment. I'm going to show you guys my reaction to that moment. And but Dober just eats it like a tic tac and lands a shot of his own. One two from Silva. Nice, dude. Silva's going to win this round. Silva wins this round. Two zero Silva. Dober's landed some great strikes, but I think Silva wins. Jab from Silva. If there was any doubt, if there was any doubt, holy shit. If there was any doubt of who won that round, Silva just spinning elbowed Drew Dober and had him doing the Irish jig. But overall, Gene Silva won the first round. He won the second, cut Drew Dober open with a nasty elbow in the third, and the ref stepped in and stopped it. He outstruck Drew Dober, who... Seemed to have his chin back in full form. This was a, a classic granite-chinned Drew Dober showing up. I know he's been put away a couple of times, and maybe some of us were thinking that his chin would never be as good as it was back in the day as far as durability goes. It was, and Gene Silva didn't need the big KO because I was getting a little bit worried when he was outstriking Dober early, and it seemed like Dober started to find his groove in the second round, and Silva had laid off on his output a little bit, and it seemed like maybe there was going to be a tide shift. And then Silva came at him with the spinning elbows. Insane speed from Gene Silva. Insane head movement. Good defense. Great timing. This is his third fight in the UFC. Dude literally has three fights in the UFC. And he's already like a fan favorite. Dober. Jordan in the span of two weeks. Dober's a big step up from Jordan, by the way. And I picked Jordan to beat him. And he impressed me. All right, um, so yeah, he just went from Weston Wilson to Jordan to Dober. The next evolution would be like a top 10 guy in either division. He could stay at lightweight, but let's move him down to featherweight. I think he would be a little undersized against some of the bigger grapplers at lightweight, but featherweight skill, man. People keep doubting featherweight skill. And it's not just about featherweight skill. It's about just lower weight class skill. All right, striking specifically, the speed of guys coming up at weight class is always better. Uh, I think you do Gene Silva versus Yair Rodriguez if you want to go crazy. I don't know if Yair is going to take that fight. Someone told me that Yair um, isn't going to be ready to fight on UFC Noche, but imagine how sick that fight would be because you just know if there's anyone that's going to give Yair a striking battle that's actually going to stand with him, it's Gene Silva. Or, because Yair might not even take that even if he is ready to fight, on UFC Noche because Gene Silva's not ranked high enough. Maybe you do Gene Silva versus Emmett. Or maybe you do Gene Silva versus Lerone Murphy. Either way, this guy saved the card in a big way. Imagine this fight wasn't on this card. It would still be a good card, but this really was like a, a fight of the year sort of fight. I want to see G I want to see Gene Silva get rewarded with like someone ranked. Someone in the top 15 of either division, whatever division he wants to stay in, but rank him. Give him someone ranked. Because right off the... Like, he gained aura from this fight. Standing with Drew Dober, slugging with Drew Dober, he gained aura from this fight. He's the real... What did I say? He was the real Joe Anderson Brito. People were hyping up Joe Anderson Brito as being like the dark horse of his division. Gene Silva's the real Joe Anderson Brito. But I want to see him fight someone ranked. Um, yeah. Amazing fight. I'm happy Dober didn't retire. Uh, why would he retire, right? I mean, he, he seems fine. But people were saying, oh, is he about to retire? 
amazing fight from both guys. Fight of the night. Really impressive from Gene Silva. I'm happy that I picked him. Uh, Santiago Pontanibio versus Muslim Salikov. I honestly, first off, I picked Santiago Pontanibio. The old frog physique, wobbly, cobbly Santiago versus the old crafty vet from Dagestan who doesn't know where he is, Muslim Salikov. All right. I picked Santiago, and I honestly thought that he won the first round, and I thought that he won the third. I thought Salikov won the second. I thought Santiago won this fight. Maybe I didn't watch it close enough because we were kind of joking around about the fight a little bit. But um, yeah, it was a good fight. This was like the real Alex Morano and Nico Price fight. Like this was the high level Morano versus Nico Price. And they're both older than both of those guys. We think of Nico Price and Morano as being old. Those guys are like 33. These guys are like 40. Uh, and Crafty Santiago and Muslim Salikov had a decent fight. Salikov was landing some thudding hooks and some spinning back kicks and spinning back fists and Santiago was landing his big haymakers and he was grappling in the third good fight overall veteran fight but I thought Santiago Ponzinibbio edged it out I could have been eight and three dude if they had just freaking not let Brundage act his way out of that one and Brundage actually got KO'd I would have been seven and three and if I got this one right I would have been eight and three so I would have had a good night Let's get on to the next one. Rose Namahunas versus Tracy Cortez. Namahunas knocks down Tracy Cortez in the first round. I'm thinking, yo, let's go. This is the best card ever. And then we get five more rounds. So dominant, easy. Literally, Tracy Cortez had nothing for Rose Namahunas until the last couple minutes of the fight. 50-45. I predicted a 50-45 um, or just an easy win for Rose Namahunas. And she got it done. Let me know what you guys think in the comments. Until next time.